Okay, it is exactly eleven o'clock, uh, so we'll go ahead and start the class. Okay, I know it's been a long session today. How was the two classes earlier? It was fine. Sir. You were able to understand. You were able to follow everything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, fine. Now I'll be uh, muting everybody. Later on, if at all, if you want to communicate anything, you can unmute yourself and then you can now talk to me. Okay, so let me mute everybody first. Okay, sir. Okay. Fine. As you know, today's topic would be regenerative periodontal surgery. We have already done this class before, but uh, uh, many of them have missed this class because of. Uh, the cultural and the sports thing which was happening, university sports which was happening. Okay, so we'll be repeating this class. Okay, before genitive surgery, uh, there was a class conducted on resective osseous surgery. Okay, so now what's the difference between regenerative osseous surgery and resective osseous surgery? In resective osseous surgery, you will be removing the bone wherein your osteoplasty, osteectomy, all those comes into picture. And there are various steps in resective osseous surgery. Whereas in regenerative osseous surgery, or when we say about regenerative periodontal surgery, we are adding something. That means we are trying to regenerate something. Okay. So before moving further into regenerative periodontal surgery, we need to understand few terminologies or definitions of few of the terms which are used in the class first would be repair so what is repair it is healing of a wound by tissue that does not fully restore the architecture or function of the part as in case of long junctional epithelium formation or in case of ankylosis then we also keep using the term reattachment so when i say reattachment it is to attach again. Okay. It's the union of reunion of epithelial and connective tissue with root surfaces and bone, such as uh, which occurs after giving an incision or after an injury. Okay. So to give example, it is supracrestal fibrotomy. This is one procedure which is done after uh, orthodontic uh, therapy. So here there is reattachment. The healing happens by reattachment. Okay, then what is healing by long junctional epithelium formation? Here, the bone is new, but the periodontal ligament is not. Okay. See what's happening. If you can see this picture, let me know if you can see my uh, drawing. If you're at all, if you're not able to see what I try to draw here, please uh, share it in. Uh, the message so that I can uh, make some corrections here. Okay, see, this is the long junction epithelium. If you can see this, this is the long junction epithelium which is formed. There is attachment of the epithelium, but there is no attachment of periodontal ligament to the bone. Okay. This is healing by long junction epithelium formation. Further, new attachment. This is also a new term which is being used. I mean, we, uh, I mean uh, the common term which you frequently come across. Here, the reunion of connective tissue with an unhealthy or previously diseased root surface 
that has been deprived of its original attachment apparatus. This new attachment may be epithelial adhesion and or connected to tissue adaptation or attachment may include new cement. That means previously it was diseased. Now there is new attachment which is taking place. And finally, coming to regeneration. Regeneration is a reprodu reproduction or reconstruction of the lost or injured parts by restoration of new bone, cementum, and periodont ligament on an unhealthy or previously diseased root surface. Ideally, complete restoration would also restore total function. That means there is new connective tissue formation new periodontal ligament formation, new bone formation, and there is attachment between periodontal ligament and the bone. Sorry, if, uh, the periodontal ligament attaches from root surface to the bone. And also we frequently use the term bone fill. Okay, Bone fill is defined as clinical restoration of bone tissue in a treated periodontal defect. Bone fill does not address the presence or absence of histologic evidence of new connective tissue attachment or the formation of new periodontal ligament. Here only bone formation happens, but the, we, may, we may not be able to explain whether there is connective tissue attachment or whether there is periodontal ligament attachment. Okay. Moving further, we need to understand the term guided tissue regeneration. So it is the method for prevention of epithelial migration along the cemental wall of the pocket and maintaining space for clot stabilization. This is the term used for explaining guided tissue regeneration. Okay. So before moving further, let us explain with this picture. What happens after periodontal surgery? So let's say here we have done periodontal surgery and we have closed the flap. So how is it expected to heal? So ideally what should happen is, see this is the place where there is periodontal ligament cells present. The periodontal ligament cells should migrate here. The bone surface has osteoblast. The osteoblast has to migrate here. And this is the gingival connective tissue that has to migrate here. And this is the gingival epithelial cells which has to migrate in this region. And this periodontal ligament cells, that is your fibroblast, should produce periodontal ligament here. Bone should form bone here. And there should be attachment of periodontal ligament and, I mean, there should be attachment of periodontal ligament from root surface to the bone, newly formed bone. And there should be connective tissue, gingival connective tissue, which should be attached over here and epithelial attachment by forming junctional epithelium here. This is how it is supposed to heal. But what happens is, so let me erase this one. What happens, this is your gingival epithelial cells. This is the gingival epithelium. The gingival epithelial cells migrate at a faster rate into this region. And this entire area is occupied by gingival epithelial cells. When that happens, this epithelium completely attaches onto the root surface and thereby it prevents these other cells, other regenerative cells like your fibroblasts, osteoblasts to migrate into this region. So when that happens, there is healing by long junction epithelium formation. This is not desirable. Okay. Are you able to follow? Yes, sir. You are able to hear? Sir. Okay. Yes, so if, there, if I'm too fast, please let me know. I'll slow down a little bit. Is the speed okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So now what does this guided tissue regeneration do? So now what we need to do is we need to prevent these epithelial cells. So the epithelial cells which migrates and occupies this area, we need to prevent that one in to, uh, from migrating to this region so how do we do that so we'll place a barrier membrane as you see in this picture 
you place a barrier membrane like this here. So this gray thing, what you see is a barrier membrane. So when you place this barrier membrane, it will prevent the epithelial cells from migrating from this region to the defect area. So when you prevent that one, the other regenerative cells, that is your osteoblasts, osteoblasts from this region, and uh, fibroblasts from this region to migrate into this region. That is the defect area and form the desired cells. As you see on the right side, so there is pedant ligament which is formed here, bone which is formed, and there is attachment between pedant ligament and the bone. Okay, this is the concept of guided tissue regeneration. Now, there are various barrier membranes which are used okay so earlier it was being used more most of the times we were using non-degradable or non-resorbable membranes okay but now nowadays we're using resorbable membranes however you need to know both of those okay. so in case of non-resorbable membranes we use expanded polytetrafluoroethylene and also dense polytetrafluoroethylene millipore and nucleopore and silicon barriers these were being used as non-resorbable membranes the disadvantage with non-resorbable membranes are that after the regeneration is complete that means after parent leg went bone everything is formed um, there would be need for another surgery to remove this membrane from that area from the defect area so this was like subjecting the patient unnecessarily for second surgery so they came up with resorbable membranes and these resorbable membranes can be further classified as synthetic and natural depending on its origin. If it is synthetic, it could be polylactide, polyglycolic acid, vicryl mesh, cargyl membrane. All these are synthetic resorbable membranes. That means you place the membrane, you finish the surgery and there will be regeneration happening and gradually this membrane would resolve. In case of natural natural uh, membrane, natural resorbable membrane, it would be collagen membrane. So nowadays we are using mostly it is collagen membrane, mostly of uh, either bovine origin or of uh, even fish collagen has been uh, used to uh, when with the uh, with a good success rate, fish collagen membrane is being used nowadays. Okay. And uh, the recent advances in uh, membranes are membranes containing some additive agents like antibiotics or uh, growth factors like uh, platelet derived growth factor or bone morphogenic proteins or enamel derived proteins. It has been combined like that. It means there's a coating of these materials which enhances the regenerative capacity of the membrane. Okay, that means it will help in uh, attracting the regenerative cells, that is fibroblasts and osteoblasts, to the defect area. Okay. So, where is this GTR membrane indicated? So uh, these are the this is the list of uh, indications for GTI membrane in class two furcation you can use sometimes even in class three furcation also it has been used and infra bony defects recessions class one and class two and to restore uh, pedant ligament attachment in narrow two or three volt infra bony defect that is same as uh, intra bony defect. So the other name for infra bony defect is angular defect. And all alveolar ridge augmentation, repair of apicectomy defects. That means your post endodontic surgery. After that, you want bone to form over there because you would have, you would have removed some amount of bone. And so you can use membrane to prevent epithelial migration to that area. Contraindications. That means where you can't use or where you should not uh, try or attempt using regeneration uh, sorry uh, gtr membrane okay. in case where the flap vascularity is compromised if the vascularity is compromised then you should not be attempting gtr 
can very severe defect and very minimal periodontal bone support remaining even in that case if you try to use gta membrane it may not be successful in horizontal defects of course regeneration is not possible so there's no point in using gta membrane and in case if you have perforated the flap that means while doing the flap surgery because of uh, poor handling of the flap if the flap gets perforated then you should not be attempting gtr procedure okay now let's come to the procedure okay, it's very simple very easy just like flap surgery is flap surgery done in the class previous class yes sir, yes, sir. okay so when we say flap we do flap surgery to gain access to the underlying structures that is the root surface and the bone surface isn't it okay so now we have got the access to the underlying structures we have done all the debridement so let me explain with that, that one with a picture see here a flap has been reflected now we have access to the root surfaces here and the bone surface now you will be able to see the defect okay so what kind of defect we'll get to know will debride this area that is clean up this area completely remove all the calculus which is present on the root surfaces and all the granulation tissue we remove that and now we know there is a uh, in this case it is a let's assume that it is three wall defect and also there is grade two furcation involvement so now we will place bone graft here let's say we'll place bone graft some amount of bone graft here and then we will place a gtr membrane see this gray thing what you see here is the gtr membrane okay. so now depending on the defect depending on the shape of the defect you cut the gtr membrane and place it over here and you should make sure that there is gtr membrane all over the bone 3 mm in all the direction see this is placed on the bone that means the remaining bone surrounding bone the gtr membrane should rest on that remaining normal surrounding bone so three millimeter all over should be placed on the remaining bone okay and then once you place that one you stabilize by suturing the membrane you can suture the membrane and then close the flap and when you close the flap they should not be I mean the membrane should not be visible okay. so the membrane should not be visible when you close the flap okay. now that is about gta membrane now we will just just give me a minute just i'll just pause the share for a minute hello hello yes sir Hello, Prashant. Non class actor, eh? Nando, I am taking my class. Yeah. Hello, uh, are you are you online? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. so yes, sir. let's continue the class. So now let's go on and uh, understand what is graft. Okay, so graft is a viable tissue that after removal from a donor site it's implanted with a recipient tissue and then restored repaired and regenerated so when you place a graft you are restoring some tissue repairing the tissue and also try to regenerate that lost tissue okay in terms from periodontal point of view what is grafting so it is the procedure used to replace restore missing bone or gum tissue that is your gingival tissue now what are bone grafts i'll not be talking about the soft tissue grafts 
because that will be dealt in mucogingival surgeries. I'll be just concentrating on bone grafts. Okay. Bone grafts are the materials used for replacement or augmentation of the bone. Okay, and uh, FDA regulates this bone graft materials. That means which material to be used is regulated by Food Drug and Administration. Now, what is the rationale behind using bone graft? Firstly, it is used to enhance the regenerative capacity of bone. And secondly, to achieve new attachment apparatus. When we say attachment apparatus, it involves periodontal ligament, alveolar bone and cementum, including gingiva. Now, the materials, the bone graft materials which are used can be classified into three types based on its function. This is given by Elgart and Nielsen et al. Okay. So, depending on how it acts, how it functions. Okay, so uh, this classification is based on that. Further, we'll have one more classification which is based on the origin of the material. So when we say osteoproliferative or osteogenic, it has it, it has capacity to regenerate bone on its own. That means it has viable cells. It has live cells which are present, which can form bone. When we say live cells, it is the osteoblasts which are present in this bone graft. Then there are materials which are osteoconductive. That means it just stays there as a scaffold it doesn't have any regenerative capacity of its own but it allows the cells osteoblasts to migrate from the surrounding areas and occupy its space and gradually the bone graft resorbs as and when the bone forms or it may get all these materials may get incorporated into the bone itself this is osteoconductive. I'll be further in the subsequent slides. We will go a little more in detail of all these materials. Okay. Then there is osteoinductive materials. These materials induces bone formation. Okay, that means it has some material within it which will attract the cells to towards this bone graft. Okay, it could be some growth factors or bone morphogenic proteins which are present within the bone graft. Okay, okay so let's go into these materials in uh, detail. Okay, so when we say osteogenesis, as I told earlier, it is the process of bone formation which begins with either osteoblasts in the patient's natural bone or from surviving cells in the bone graft that is placed. That means the bone graft itself has osteoblasts within it. Okay, so here osteoblasts in the transplanted bone having adequate blood supply and cellular viability, it forms new centers of ossification within the graft and this ossification goes on increasing and subsequently resulting in bone formation. Osseo induction, it is a chemical process by which the molecules contained in the bone graft, okay, it could be either growth factors or bone morphogenic protein, which convert the neighboring cells into osteoblasts, which in turn form bone. Okay. So when we talk about cells of periodontal ligament, we would have told you about there are something called as progenitor cells, or undifferentiated mesenchymal cells which are present in the periodontal ligament. Okay, these undifferentiated mesenchymal cells has potential to develop into any of the regenerative cells. That, that means it can get converted into fibroblasts, cementoblasts, or osteoblasts. Okay, in the presence of these growth factors or bone morphogenic proteins, these undifferentiated mesenchymal cells which are present in vicinity get converted into osteoblasts and in turn it forms bone okay this is how the osteoinductive bone graft works okay. are you able to follow this yes sir okay yes sir, yes, sir. all right fine so next we'll go to osteoconduction 
okay these are uh, mostly passive materials it just can it just occupies the defect area and it allows the cells that is bone cells osteoblasts into penetrate into the graft and form new bone okay so this may eventually resolve or it may get incorporated into the bone itself Okay, now let's see what are the indications for bone grafts. Okay, so in deep intraosseous defects, or when uh, when we require uh, bone support for critical teeth, that means the teeth which is uh, in borderline uh, prognosis, and we know, need to improve the condition of the tooth, the bone support and the periodontal ligament support of the tooth. Okay, and bone defects associated with aggressive periodontitis, we can attempt bone grafts there. Aesthetics, as in cases of intraosseous defects, furcation defects, all these areas we can use bone grafts. Now, this classification, what you're seeing on the screen, is based on its origin. Where do we take the graft from? Based on that, this classification has been given. The first classification, what uh, we discussed previously, was based on how it functions, whereas this classification is based on the origin of the bone graft. So this can be broadly classified as from human origin and bone substitutes. That means taken uh, other than humans, if you take uh, the bone grafts from anywhere else, it is called as bone substitutes. If it is human bone, it can be further classified as autografts and allografts. When we say autograft, it is taken from the same individual. Okay, when we say allograft, it is taken from another individual of the same species. That is, that means it is taken from another human being. Okay. And bone substitutes can be, it can be taken from animals that is either from uh, bovine origin or from porcine origin or even uh, from uh, the sea, sea animals like uh, corals. All these are xenografts. Okay, and then if it is synthetic, if it is not from animal origin, if it is synthetic, it is called as alloplast. Okay, if it is taken from human bone, as uh, we uh, discussed earlier, it is called as auto. I mean, it can be either autograft or allograft. If it take, if it is taken from the same individual, it is called as autogenous grafts. Here it can be further taken from extraoral sites or intraoral sites. Allogenic bone graft that is taken from other individual of the same species. This can be fresh frozen bone, freeze dried bone allografts, demineralized freeze dried bone allografts. And bone substitutes, it can be xenogenic graft that is xenografts, it can be bovine porcine or coralline origin okay. and in alloplasts we have polymers bioceramics that is tri beta tricalcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite and bioactive glasses and how do we select the bone graft materials okay so we can also call this one as ideal requirements though i'll be showing one more uh, slide which uh, which will talk about the ideal requirement of the bone graft so when we select the bone graft material, it should be based on whether it has osteoinductive or osteogenic potential. Okay. And the predictability, that means it should give a good result. It should be accessible. It should be available. And it should be safe to be used in the patients. And it should have rapid vascularization. It should allow rapid vascularization. Okay. These are the ideal characteristic of our bone grafts. It should be non-toxic, non-antigenic, should be resistant to infection. It should not cause any root resorption or ankylosis. It should be strong and resilient, easily adaptable, it should be readily and sufficiently available. Minimal surgical procedure should be required to procure the bone graft. And it should stimulate new attachment. These are the ideal characteristic of bone graft. 
Of course, not all the bone grafts will meet all these characteristics. Uh, we need to choose based on uh, the case and based on the availability of the bone graft, we need to choose whichever is best for that particular condition or a case. Okay, further uh, if talking about autografts, extraoral and intraoral, as we discussed earlier, extraoral sites are, you can take it from iliac crest, you can take it from ribs, cranium, tibial metaphysis. All these are sites where we can take extraoral bone from the same individual. If it is intraoral sites, it can be from extraction site, maxillary tuberosity, osseous, coagulum. Okay, so this osseous coagulum should not have been here. Anyways, I'll explain what is this osseous coagulum. Okay, and I think in the subsequent next slide, it will be shown what is osseous coagulum. We'll just finish this, uh, uh, the sites where we can take bone graft from. Okay, so extra oral, if you take from hip marrow, it can be either fresh frozen bone or raw frozen bone grafts. And from intraoral sites, <coughs> We, we make, we prepare osseous coagulum, uh, taking the bone graft from tuberosity extraction site and contiguous auto graft. Okay, this is uh, Schalhorn was uh, the first person who used hip marrow grafts for treatment of periodontal defects. So this has uh, highest uh, inductive potential as well as this is an autogenous bone graft. Okay, that means it also helps in inducing bone graft, I mean, sorry, osteoblast from the surrounding sites. So if at all, if you have to use um, autograft for periodontal defect, best hip marrow graft. Now let's understand the term, what is osseous coagulum as given by Robinson in 1969, okay. In this technique, what we do is we, we take bone shavings, bone shavings from the surgical sites. It may be like you may uh, use a burr or you may use a, a piezo surgery unit to harvest the bone graft. Take this bone graft, okay, and mix it with the blood of the patient, okay, and mix it in uh, such a way that it forms a homologous mixture okay. and this mixture can be transferred into the defect area. Okay. So the procedures which are given here, I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, the, there's a lot of theory which is input up, but the gist of this is you just harvest the bone from the donor site, take it in a dappen dish, take patient's own blood and mix it homologously to get a coagulum. Okay, this explains better the same thing what we had written in uh, previous slide. This has been explained in a, uh, in a graphical way. And once homogeneous mix is uh, done, you transfer it into the defect area. <coughs> see, in this uh, picture, if you can see the cursor, this is the area where the bone graft is taken from and it is mixed and put into this defect area. In the last picture you see here, sorry. So this is the area where there is bone graft has been placed. That is the osseous coagulum has been placed into that region. Okay, there's one more procedure which you need to know, which is called as bone swaging. Okay. So here what we do is, so let's say there is an edentulous area and the adjacent tooth has a defect. As said in this picture, this is an edentulous area here and this adjacent bone has a periodontal defect. So what we can do is we can create a fracture here like this and then create an incomplete fracture. It's not a complete fracture and then move this bone into the defect area as seen here. And this in this third picture, what you can see is there is bone formation adjacent to the root of this, uh, the tooth which had previously defect. 
and since there is no tooth here we had liberty to take bone graft from this region and just swage it on to the adjacent site now the question arises how it would heal here here it would heal just like how your extraction site heals there would be bone formation in this region at a later date moving on to allograft allograft is bone graft taken from a different individual of the same species here the classification is you can take fresh frozen bone demineralized free dried bone allograft freeze dried bone allograft okay these are the three uh, types of allograft which can be used okay so what are the disadvantages of fresh frozen bone okay so fresh frozen bone you directly take the bone from the receipt uh, the from the donor that is from the different individual freeze it and then use it on the patient who requests the bone graft okay the disadvantages here are that there is possibility of disease transfer because you are not treating this bone you are just taking bone from one person and putting on to the another person so there may be possibility of transferring disease from one patient to another another or uh, disadvantages there may be antigenicity that means the patient uh, can reject the bone graft which has been used okay and also cross matching has to be done before uh, before deciding who can be the donor okay and hence nowadays we are not using this fresh frozen bone okay okay so if at all if you treat these freezed bone by drying and uh, uh, demineralizing it then you can reduce antigenicity and uh, transmission of the disease can be prevented that is the reason we nowadays use demineralized freezed dried bone allograft dfdba stands for demineralized freezed dried bone allograft okay. so when you use this demineralized freezed bone uh, freezed uh, dried bone allograft you will reduce the antigenicity and reduce the risk of transmitting the disease further moving on to xenograft this is as we know it is taken from another species usually from bovine or porcine origin and this is said to be osteoconductive that means it doesn't have any regenerative capacity neither it doesn't uh, stimulate any bone bone uh, cells from the adjacent site it just acts as a scaffold similarly even alloplasts also are osteoconductive materials since it is synthetic materials it doesn't have any antigenicity and again it doesn't uh, transmit any disease because it is synthetic and also unlimited supply it's abundantly available you can use as much as required okay and these are the examples for alloplasts mainly polymers bioceramics beta tricalcium phosphide hydroxyapatite and bioactive glasses okay hydroxyapatite again it can be resorbable non resorbable if you use non resorbable it becomes part of the bone as in when the bone forms if it if you use resorbable it gradually resorbs allowing the bone to form in the defect region and one more thing uh, which uh, one more concept which we i had to address was nowadays we are using clot of platelet concentrates for regeneration okay we use platelet rich plasma as well as platelet rich fibrin okay we take patient's own blood subject it to centrifuge at different cycles if you subject and if you add certain uh, chemicals to it like anticoagulants and uh, thrombin we will be able to get different types of platelet concentrates okay so like platelet rich plasma which is in short form we call it as prp and platelet rich fibrin so of this platelet rich fibrin prf has been popular nowadays because it doesn't require anything to be added 
to it like no anti coagulants to be added we just have to subject it to centrifuge 4000 rpm for 12 minutes would give you platelet rich fibrin okay this platelet rich fibrin will have abundant amount of growth factors present in it and when you place it in the defect area it will stimulate the surrounding cells surrounding uh, structures uh, to produce cells and to migrate into the defect area and form the desired uh, tissue in that region okay so platelet rich fibrin you need to be aware of it and know how it is prepared okay, okay and to conclude as regenerative periodontal surgeries are time consuming and financially demanding uh, we as clinicians need to learn and understand factors that may influence the clinical outcome following periodontal reconstruct surgery in order to provide the best possible service to the patients okay. so i would be uploading few mcqs on this one i already uploaded few and some more mcqs i'll be uploading as well as uh, we'll uh, share some questions which may come from this chapter so i'll be giving some assignments online you try to please try to complete that one so now i'll be unmuting everybody if you have any doubts any questions please feel free to ask uh, first thing uh, have you, have you have you given your attendance all of you have you given your attendance Sir. Okay, uh, were you able to follow the class? Sir. Yes, sir. You're able to understand. Sir. Okay, is there any doubts which I can clarify now? Hello. Hello. Yes, I'll do one thing. One second, I'll mute everybody. Whoever has any question, please uh, unmute yourself and answer. Or you can raise your hand so that I will uh, ask. I, I'll be able to get back to you and ask if you have any doubts. So, can you explain oste osteoinductive ones? Osteoinductive. Okay. Uh, is it Aditi? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, Aditi. Aditi, osteoinductive, the name itself suggests what it does. Osteo inductive that means it induces the surrounding structures or surrounding tissues to for to attract the cells into that region okay so when you place this osteo inductive material or osteo inductive graft into the defect site it it attracts few cells which can form the desired tissue into that region for example in periodontal defect this, let's say there's a two wall defect and you place osteoinductive bone graft. So it will attract the cells from periodontal ligament cells, that is, undifferentiated mesenchymal cells, migrate to that area and it gets differentiated into osteoblasts and form bone into that region. So that is the concept of osteoinduction. Yes. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other doubts? Anyone else? You can ask me now. So, which is the most preferred um, graft among all these? Okay. Uh, Vaishali, since autograft is osteogenic, Okay, so that means it has viable cells. It has osteoblasts within it. You yes, prefer autograft always. Okay, but uh, autograft requires one uh, additional surgery where we need to harvest the bone graft from some other region. So it could be intraoral or extraoral. Since that requires one more surgery, most of the 
patient may not agree to undergo one more surgery so in that case what we what is next best material is we have osteo inductive material so the second preferred the first preferred material is osteogenic material that is autograft okay since that requires second surgery so we would uh, prefer allograft which is osteo inductive okay Did I thank you your question yes sir okay Okay could you please uh, share